uh, as again, um, we will be starting the session um, very shortly. So thank you to those who have joined so far and those who are in the process uh, of jumping on to this meeting. Um, my name's Sarah uh, and I head up the uh, client engagement uh, team here at NetThreat. Um, and welcome to the state of cyber security um, from network to endpoint and beyond. I think we will make a start now as it is 10 30. Uh, so thanks for those who are here and welcome to those who are coming online and joining us. Um, just uh, introducing the session, uh, as I said, we have Ollie uh, Venn here from WatchGuard and Pete Cord um, from our team here at NetThreat. Um, Ollie, I'd like to start with asking you to introduce yourself and just saying a few words, if I may, please. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Sarah and the team, for, uh, for having me join you today. Um, I am Ollie. I'm um, the Northern European uh, Sales Engineering Manager for uh, for WatchGuard. Thank you, Ollie. And Pete? Yes, good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to you today. We, As Sarah mentioned, we do appreciate you taking the time out of your busy uh, days uh, for this NetThreat webinar in association with WatchGuard. Uh, my name is Pete Cord. I've been a sales account manager here for um, over seven years now. Um, and it's great to have Ollie with us from WatchGuard. Um, we'll be hearing a bit more later from him, as I know he has lots to share with us today. Um, so a little bit about NetThreat, just just quickly, I'll come back to you later, but we, we started back in the early noughties. Um, Jonathan Raymond started the company back in, I think, 2003, um, <clears throat> and we're, we're now a well-established company within the industry. Uh, we're very proud to hold gold partner status with them. Uh, we do hold, um, we do like to retain uh, strong links within the channel all the way up to senior management team, um, which does come in handy if we ever need to escalate any customer issues. Um, as I say, I'll be on a bit later on to tell you a bit more about our services. Um, but for now, let's press on with the reason that we're all here, the main purpose of today's session, which is to look at the current state of cybersecurity, how to achieve unified holistic protection without the hassle. Uh, we're also going to be looking uh, at the latest WatchGuard solutions and, of course, what is coming next on the WatchGuard roadmap. Um, before we hand over to Ollie, I'll hand back to Sarah for some housekeeping bits. OK, thanks, thanks Pete. I'll be really quick. Uh, just a reminder that the session is being recorded. We will be making it available on demand afterwards and microphones are muted uh, currently. And a reminder about the Q&A at the end. Uh, please use the online uh, chat facility if you have any questions. And let's get cracking and straight over to Ollie to get started. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, so uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I, like I said, I'm Ollie Venn, I'm the uh, sales engineering manager for uh, for, for WatchGuard, uh, covering the the Northern European territory. Um, I, I'm going to talk through this morning around the uh, the sort of threat landscape and um, and sort of some of the things we're seeing and and how to uh, to protect ourselves from those. Um, a little bit about my background quickly before we start. Um, I've been with WatchGuard now for around six years. Um, I was actually prior to that uh, an end user, so I was infrastructure and security lead for the UK's largest car and lot yacht dealership group. Um, and I bought WatchGuard products 13, 14 years ago. Um, loved them so much that I, um, as soon as an opportunity came to work for the company six years ago, I had to uh, to snap it up. Um, I am going to drop off camera just simply because I'm currently working in a hotel room, um, traveling around Europe at the moment. So I'm going to drop off camera just for the sake of hopefully keeping a stable connection. Um, but um, yeah, hopefully you uh, enjoy the presentation. Now, normally I would start off if I'm presenting this to a room full of people um, by getting them to show hands. Don't worry, I'm not going to get people to uh, to try and do that today. Um, it's mainly just make sure everybody's paying attention and not falling asleep sleep but um, it's 10 30 in the morning so hopefully everybody's still awake so um, what I want you to do is just have a quick think uh, to yourselves um, and think how many pieces of malware are created on a daily basis do you think um, the options you've got four choices so 25% chance of being right even if it's a stab in the dark um, 110,000 230,000 350,000 or 560,000 feel free to drop your guess into the chat if you if you so wish as well give people a few seconds just to to do that if they want to the 560 from Giles yeah it's a couple of people saying 560 you'll be 
I don't know whether pleased to know you're right. Um, <laughs> so uh, you are right. It's 560,000 um, new strains of, or new pieces of malware are created every single day, which is a huge number. Um, unfortunately, Charles, I don't have any prizes. <laughs> um, I'm sure we can do we, a live demo. We can, we can maybe uh, send you a goodie bag. How about that? <laughs> There we go. Um, but it is a staggering number. And the scary thing is this is getting sort of higher and higher. Uh, AI is probably a big driver behind this because it's creating new strains of existing malware every day to sort of try and avoid um, techniques that are detecting it. Um, another interesting stat is Google were taking down, um, uh, sorry, a, a, a detecting um, new sites and being able to prevent them from appearing in Google searches, etc. 50 websites every week. Now, that number is actually quite low. Um, and I was like, oh, I was expecting it to be significantly higher than that. Um, and the reason for that is because actually malware is often hosted in things like Dropbox and Salesforce and, uh, sorry, not Salesforce, SharePoint and, and sort of known legitimate websites. And obviously they can't take those down. Um, so it, it, it it's quite hard for them to uh, to 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 do anything about those ones other than reporting them to the likes of Microsoft and Dropbox, et cetera, to say, hey, this account is, is hosting malicious material. Um, a really sort of staggering number as well is 88% of UK companies have suffered some kind of security breach in the last 12 months. Now, that could uh, be credentials of theirs have been found on the dark web, um, or it could be that they've suffered ransomware. So it, it's it's a variety of things, but the, the huge amount is that or well, the worrying amount is that only 12% of businesses haven't suffered some kind of breach um, in, in that 12 month period. So this is really highlighting that cyber security is affecting everybody these days. Um, often it was for, for, especially for the smaller and mid-sized businesses, it was like, well, it never happened to me. Why do I need to worry? Well, this, this stat published by the, uh, the UK government actually is showing that there is significant rises. Um, I do have a few more stats um, from the UK government and Hiscox Insurance um, based on sort of some of the things that they're seeing. Um, one of those is that one small business in the UK is successfully hacked every 19 seconds. So they say small business, but it's, it's more small to mid-sized businesses. Um, it's estimated that there's around 65,000 attempts to hack uh, these businesses every single day and around four and a half thousand of those are actually successful um, which equates to around 1.6 million of the 5.7 million uh, small businesses in the UK um, have seen um, an attack sort of throughout the year uh, that was published by Hiscox Insurance um, earlier on this year based on the data that they've seen. 48% um, of um, UK organizations have hit by some kind of ransomware in the last year as well. Um, and really worryingly, 13% of UK uh, organizations have paid that ransom fee. Um, now, I did some digging into this and found out that actually a few years ago, that, that fee was, the, the payout of that fee was higher um, because people weren't taking it as seriously as they should have been. Um, so they, um, were, didn't have backups in place and offsite storage or however it may have been. So they were having and forced to pay the, uh, the ransom fee. The other interesting thing is uh, the hacking community um, has a code of practice, bizarrely, for criminals. Um, they have working ethics. Again, really strange. Um, but it seems to be fewer and fewer groups are actually following those these days. There used to be um, a code that, that basically said that hackers would honor a payment. So if you paid the ransom fee that they would honor that and they would make, um, uh, that they would release the, the, the key to retrieve that data. Um, unfortunately, there's more and more cases now being reported where that's not happening. Um, it may even be, and we've seen it uh, quite a lot over the last two years, where a large group have just automated the ransom. It's spread out to so many computers. They've taken enough money that they then just shut down the, the site that collects the Bitcoin. So it, it might still collect the money um, and there's just nobody there behind it doing the, the sort of releasing of the key or just that there's no way of getting out of it, um, which is, is quite uh, worrying. The cost of um, remediation um, from a successful ransomware attack 
in enterprise businesses is estimated to be about eight hundred and forty thousand dollars. Um, this is higher than the global average, which currently sits at around seventy uh, seven hundred and sixty one thousand um, dollars. And the reason for this is because it's not just sort of paying a ransom fee, which uh, obviously we never recommend to do because you're effectively giving criminals money. Uh, actually, just spotted in the chat is exactly what Andrew's just said. Um, but also, it's the the remediation. Like, if your environment gets compromised, it's it could be downtime, so loss of earnings through downtime of systems being unavailable. Uh, it could be brand reputation. But often, it's the remediation um, and the forensics that needs to take place afterwards to ensure that that environment is now clean because often hackers don't come in do a ransomware and then walk away they will have been in your environment for some time beforehand understanding the lay of the land maybe even leaving back doors in there so if you were to pay the ransom fee maybe six months down the line you suddenly get ransomware again um, because they've left a back door in or they then sell that back door to somebody else that can do whatever so after you've restored your systems there's a process of forensic data of, of trying to analyze right how did they get in what did they do what were they able to see and and can we guarantee that our environment is now clean and that's why this number is, is actually really really high um i know of one uk organization that literally went out and bought new pcs and servers across their whole estate they are a well-known uk company um i can't name them because i've signed an nda um but they um they literally went you know what the pcs are three years old the cost of rebuilding every single one it's just not worth it we will just ship out new hardware to every single person um and th that way they guaranteed that their estate was clean um most businesses can't do that they were out of operation for about three and a half weeks um whilst this took place how it didn't make the media i never know um but yeah they were they were hit um and they realized actually this is um pretty significant to them um around half of the attacks uh sorry in fact i'm going to step back because i forgot to cover one important thing 32 percent of uk companies have cyber insurance that doesn't cover ransomware as well that's something really really astonishing and every time i've spoken to somebody um about this they're like well mine does I think um, they've then gone and checked and been like, there's some really random get out clause that prevents them from ransomware. Um, the I spoke with his Cox um, about this stat as well. And they said um, it's it, it's often that if you're doing everything right, you shouldn't need ransomware protection. Um, and often you're required to tick a load of boxes um, to say that you've got coverage. And in reality, you don't. And one of their biggest get outs is talking about like multi-factor authentication on the um, on external access and they will go and do an audit and they will check to make sure every single piece of external access um, has got MFA um, and quite often they will be like yeah you might have put MFA on your VPN but you've not thought about all the other systems it might be that you've missed Office 365 or Salesforce or whatever sort of cloud-based applications they're still classified as external access and they weren't protected so therefore you're not covered with the insurance. Um, half of cyber attacks in the UK generally start with phishing, which is approximately 20% higher than the global average. Um, so this is why phishing education is really important, educating users, making sure that they are sort of alert and awake and, and aware of what the, their actions can actually do. Um, user education is key to our cybersecurity success. Um, I always make a joke that if we didn't have users, we probably wouldn't sell much because we, we wouldn't need the technology. Um, but it, they are our strongest layer of defense. Um, we have a, a technology that does DNS filtering. The, the argument is that the very first protocol when a user clicks a link is it does a DNS query. Well, I argue that actually the very first protocol is um, clicking the link the mouse click itself. So if we can stop the mouse click, then we don't need the uh, the technology that sits behind it. Um, also, businesses are getting more complex. Um, think about your own environments. Has it moved to the cloud? Are you doing more cloud-based stuff? Are you now operating in um, sort of a hybrid environment with remote workers? 62% of mid-market organizations are saying that their environments are now significantly more complex than they were a couple of years ago. Um, 
So I'm going to talk about, I think I've got two or three um, top cybersecurity threats. Um, they pretty much don't change much from year to year, uh, um, but it's always worth highlighting them um, because they are the, the sort of easy things to uh, to be concerned about. The number one is account takeover. Um, this isn't anything new, but definitely becomes uh, more and more um, prevalent these days. Back in um, 2002, we saw the first mandatory breach disclosure law being created. Um, and even Bill Gates in 2004 said that passwords are dead. I'm sure every single one of us 20 years later is still using a password um, to, to gain access to systems. Um, there's been um, multiple attacks over the years. Um, and we've seen sort of various uh, use cases or sort of incidents where, where sort of passwords and account takeover has happened. Um, often I hear the question of like, well, hey, I just want to protect my, um, my senior management team. How do I do that? And um, my question is, why? Why would you only want to protect your senior management team? They're like, well, nobody else in the business has got important emails. I'm like, no, everybody's got an important email. Um, we saw it with malware bytes a few years ago where a dormant test account um, was used in a hack. Basically, they gained access to that account and then tried laterally moving from there to other accounts. Because if you think about it, often your mail filtering is protecting you from external mail. It doesn't protect you from internal email. So if a threat actor was able to get access to a uh, an employee's credential that you don't deem to be have valuable data, so often a good example was the cleaner. They might think, well, I'm not bothered if somebody gets access to the cleaner's email. But what if that cleaner then starts emailing payroll saying, hey, um, I need to update my bank details. Can you click this PDF or whatever um, with my updated bank details? And they click it and actually it contains malware. It wouldn't have been picked up by the email filtering because it's internal. And this is often what happens. Um, Appreciate sometimes this slide is really hard to see depending on your screen, um, but this is um, what's called phishing as a service. Um, it, it's meant to be for simulation training. So you can host a website, um, or sorry, they can host a website for you that contains um, a phishing sim. Um, and, and basically what will happen is you pay them um, sort of, if you take Microsoft 365, for example, it's $150 and they will host this website for you for 10 days. All you have to do is upload a load of emails, addresses to this site, and it will send out the phishing simulation to those email addresses and host the backend content. Um, you literally don't have to do anything other than supply emails. So you don't even have to be technical to take advantage of this phishing as a service um, to, to go and sort of launch attacks. Um, it's really scary because the, the websites look perfectly genuine. Um, in Office 365, if you're using the Microsoft Authenticator, it will even clone the, um, the, the MFA token that Microsoft is using um, unless you're using a third-party service. So you get from this, username, password, and MFA token in the uh, in the case of Microsoft. And you don't need to be technical. So this could even be a disgruntled employee. We saw um, a few years ago the Morrison's data breach um, where all employee credentials were leaked. Uh, sorry, all employee data was leaked. So home addresses, um, national insurance numbers, bank account details, even how much they were being paid. That was all leaked due to a disgruntled employee. Um, they weren't a techie, um, they were just annoyed with Morrison's, so they stole the data and then leaked it. Um, and, and that could happen uh, today and does happen today far too often. The next um, cybersecurity threat that we talk about is fileless malware. Um, so fileless malware is, um, <laughs> the term is a bit loose, um, but basically it, it's malware that runs in memory. Often they do start with a file, so it might be that it starts on um, through Word or something like that, and I'll explain how that can, can happen. They will often use living off the land, um, which basically means tools that are already installed on the computer. So things like PowerShell, um, and um, it will launch a script, which then like, launches the code into memory. They aren't new. Um, we first saw our first memory uh, sort of residual uh, virus back in the 80s, um, and obviously they just keep progressing. It's harder for AV to detect them because it's not using a file as such, um, so that's why they're, they're 
obviously becoming more and more common. I'll give you this example um, of a word, um, uh, something called dynamic data execution, which um, you may know, you may not do. Um, Microsoft have actually patched this or corrected it. It now gives you a better security warning message. Um, but if you're running an older version of Office, for example, you will still get the, the same message that I'm about to show. So I've got a Word document. I can use dynamic data execution to basically pull in commands from external sources. It may be that I want to load an image from my PC. Uh, it's probably the simplest form. But what I can also do is I can launch commands. So in this case, I'm actually using the command prompt to open up calculator because I'm a good guy. Right. But imagine if I wasn't. Imagine if I was then launching some scripts that starts loading stuff into the memory and it's then doing key logging, looking for your credentials, or it's loading malware directly into the memory. You would kind of assume with Word, if I'm launching something that can be pulling code from an external source, I'm going to get a great big banner at the top warning me, danger, Will Robinson, do not click this. Like we've all seen with macros. If you open up a document and it contains macros, we were taught many years ago, don't open up macros and it will give you a warning banner at the top. No. What does Word do? It gives me a gray message that says this document contains links that may refer to other files. Do you want to update this document with the data from the linked files? And you're like, sure. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Who knows what that's actually doing, right? Because I wouldn't. It doesn't give you any context. It would just be like, yeah. And I can guarantee every single one of your users would probably just hit yes. Um, because it's not a security warning. There's no danger. This may be harmful, etc. It's just like, yeah, sure, OK. Oh, I click yes, not realizing you've now just loaded code into the example. In my case, I click yes, it opens the calculator. And I'm like, phew, it was just me testing. Um, because who knows what else I could get up to if I was bored. Um, so this is how a lot of malware is starting. And in fact, from our own data, we've seen that 83% of um, attacks we saw over the last year started through scripts and often they're fileless so it would be that it, you've got a word for example or it could be some kind of powershell script that can initially look innocent but then turns into be quite malicious so this is why it's really important to have good um, sort of av that's edr um, that's not just looking at signature based detection and then the final um, sort of security threat that i like to talk about is software vulnerabilities um, Again, nothing new. Um, we've seen um, sort of uh, vulnerabilities being taken place uh, from the early 2000s, probably even before that, um, and sort of going back and beyond um, through that. Um, the Some of examples we've probably hear um, the blue key, eternal blue, um, and then uh, log4j. Um, but how often do you see like Java and Adobe being updated as well? It's, it's, it's all the time. The reason for that is because these threat actors know that everybody has got these. Um, but also, people don't update their systems as often as they should do. Um, the um, Again, it was probably a year or two ago, maybe even a little bit longer. Jamie Oliver's website uh, in the run up to Christmas had a paid for advert on the right hand side of their roast of his roast potatoes recipe, um, which is um, everybody obviously like, wants to make the perfect roast potatoes for Christmas. So they were going to the website. Um, and if you had a vulnerable version of Java, which was patched, I believe, four years prior to this Christmas period, um, and you moved your mouse over the advert, you didn't even have to click it. It basically took an exploit in that Java and installed remote access tools, giving a hacker access to your PC. Um, and that's pretty scary for something that had been patched four years prior. But the hackers are still using these tools because people aren't patching their systems. They knew that they were going to get victims. Um, and, and and that's exactly what they did. We see the cost of data breaches um, through uh, the, the methods that I've mentioned. So phishing, as well as stolen credentials and uh, sort of email compromise, they're all up there. But third party uh, software is also up there um, as, as sort of a high um, cost vector. Um, Giles, I've just seen your message, PDF with links. So PDF with links that wouldn't automatically load um, because you have to click the link for it to actually execute, if that's what you're uh, you're referring to. Um, the reasons why hackers do all of this is um, this 
pretty much everything that I've just covered is hackers don't break into an environment these days. They use automation and they would just simply log in. They're using automation to look for uh, weak credentials. They're using uh, uh, automation to, to deploy things like fileless malware. And they're using automation for looking for vulnerabilities. And then the victims come to them. They're not going out hunting. They are just setting their nets and then the victims will come into them. Another quick pop quiz for you then. Uh, again, if you want to put your, uh, your your guesses into the chat, what percentage of malware evades basic detection methods um, these days? 34%, 52, 70, or 93? Giles straight in there with 93. Still paying attention. Andrew is 70. Okay. Uh, the answer is both. It's 70 and 90. Um, so zero day malware. So this is where AV um, cannot, it doesn't have a signature for the file or for the malware. Uh, equates to around 70%. But 93% of that zero day malware is actually hidden and encrypted with TLS. So it's really important to be doing deep packet inspection uh, as well in the environment. And the reason why this is all important, um, this is a picture I like from uh, Michael Maslin. Um, if you don't have the latest security, it might as well be like standing there with bows and crossbows um, and swords trying to defend a cyber attack. It's, it's pretty pointless. It, it's all about keeping up. So how do we do that? How do we defend? Unfortunately, there's not a silver bullet as much as I would like there to be. There's not one single solution that's going to protect us from everything. It's all about layering up the defenses. Um, making sure that you are sort of completely protected things like multi-factor authentication using advanced malware that's not just relying on a signature it's using things like endpoint detection and response um, and zero day uh, protection as well as using um, sort of advanced patch management and also educating those users make sure we educate those users don't click the links um, so I'm going to give a quick now I've sort of scared you a little bit I'm going to <laughs> give you a quick overview of who WatchGuard are um, I appreciate I'm really running out of time today. I've waffled on. Um, so WatchGuard have been around since 1996. We are a cybersecurity vendor. We are known for our firewalls, but we do have a whole portfolio, which I will go through. We have presence in multiple countries. Um, like I said, in, in the UK is where I'm based, but I cover the Northern Europe. So we have Benelux and, and the Nordics as well, but all across Europe. Um, we cover pretty much everybody. Um, so small to mid-sized businesses, small to mid-sized enterprises, distributed, various verticals as well, such as government education, hospitality, uh, and retail. We do have a portfolio that is all about sort of bringing the security to the masses. It's how I discovered WatchGuard many years ago. I didn't have a huge network team. Uh, it was me, myself, and I, um, but I needed to implement security. So I needed something that was easy to use um, but still really great um, sort of security efficacy. And, and that's where WatchGuard just won significantly for me. We've expanded the portfolio. We've now got Wi-Fi. We've got endpoint security with zero trust um, and DNS filtering um, with patch management and encryption available as well. We have identity protection with, uh, with MFA. Um, and obviously, we can provide remote access with things like uh, VPN. We've been innovators over the years as well. Uh, we were the first um, network and uh, endpoint threat correlation, which is now called XDR. We actually called it TDR. We were so close with the naming. Um, but Gartner decided to, uh, to call it XDR. Uh, we launched Identity back in 2018. Uh, we were the only full zero trust posture for endpoint security. Last year, we launched our uh, managed detection and response. So we actually managed the, 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 the data and the isolation, et cetera, of the environments with our SOC. Um, and then earlier this year, we launched a NDR service. So this is network detection and response um, for the mid-market, whereas this has typically been seen as an enterprise tool. We've launched this for the, uh, for the market. So we deliver it all through a single platform, which is called WatchGuard Cloud. Underneath there, we have our, 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 um, our underlying technologies, which is ThreatSync and the identity framework. ThreatSync basically pulls the data from all of the products, as well as external sources. Now with the NDR, we can pull data from things like switches, um, DHCP, uh, Active Directory, that sort of thing. 
we will be bringing in SaaS into the solution in the next month or two as well. So we can even pull in feeds from the likes of Office 365 to basically the more data we can see, the better the, the, the technology becomes because it can correlate. So we can see if a user clicks a, or if a script launches on a, a user's endpoint and it calls a, a malicious website, we see that at the firewall. Instead of just blocking at the firewall, we can then block it at the endpoint as well. And then we can tell everybody we tell all of our customers, hey, look, we've detected that this script going to this URL is malicious. Block it up for everybody. So you're automatically protected. It's just sharing this intelligence. Um, previously, it was um, sort of many years ago, the idea was to oh, have as many different vendors as possible because you're, you're guaranteeing your chat or better your odds um, of, of being successful in capturing. Well, the the thought process has changed these days. It, it's more stick to a single vendor if they're doing XDR because then they're correlating the activity across those products rather than having individual products that are just doing their own thing. They're now sharing intelligence. So the security actually gets much better and we can then start to automate as well using a lot of AI um, to sort of deliver protection um, from those services. That is it from me. Uh, handing back over to Pete. Great, thanks, Holly. That was uh, that was fantastic. Some really insightful information there. Um, just briefly wanted to mention um, that we offer a a whole host of services at NetThreat. Um, in terms of in in-house expertise, all of our sales and technical um, certs are always kept up to date, as you'd expect. Um, so you're in very safe hands, right from um, the initial inquiry right through to deployment of your new device. Um, also wanted to make you aware, we do offer ongoing support, more of a premium um, support on a monthly ongoing basis to cover your WatchGuard appliances. Um, prices starting from as little as something like 50 pounds per, per month. Um, many, many of our customers um, you know, agree that it's worth having um, you know, a higher level of support in case you ever do need us for anything. Um, and from a from a co commercial perspective, it's worth noting that, as I think it says on one of the slides there, there we go, that we're all we're also able to price match on all current quotes. So if you've received a quote from another partner, please do let us know. We'll always do our very best to to at least price match, if not beat the quote for you. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was just very quickly talking of pricing options. We do have something relatively new to share with you, something which is proving to be quite popular with a number of our customers uh, and will potentially change how you purchase hardware going forwards, um, which is that we now offer monthly payment options for your WatchGuard devices. Um, so you'll order one, one SKU, one part code. Uh, there's one recurring monthly fee. Um, and there's no minimum contract um, commitments or contract as such there. Um, it's just a case of setting up a direct debit form for all the subsequent payments. Uh, all we need is the, the first monthly payment to get you set up with that. So we're really excited about that. And uh, do give me a call after the meeting if you want to know more about that. Um, I think, Sarah, we have some cute, some questions for Ollie, do we, in the chat? Yes. Uh, so, Ollie, if I may, um, what's the biggest threat to... Uh, as small businesses at the moment? Um, so the biggest threat to a small business is probably having the thought of it will never happen to me because unfortunately it's not a question of if, it's it's when, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and the, over the years, the amount of people I've spoken to at trade shows and, and the search where they're like, oh, I'm, I'm considering going in and like, this cybersecurity technology or whatever, and then they've decided actually no budget constraints, et cetera, I, I, we didn't decide to do it. And then I speak to them later on and it's sort of after the fact of a cybersecurity incident because they didn't consider cybersecurity as, as important and they kind of sort of skipped it. So yeah, I, I think businesses need to be aware that everybody should be taking this seriously. We saw it when I started earlier on that 88% of sort of small to mid-sized businesses have been, have seen some kind of breach over the last 12 months. So I think it's, it's the, it'll never happen to me approach is, is probably the biggest threat to them. Okay. Thank you. Um, another one. Um, what's the uh, single most important thing we can do to protect our network? That's an interesting one. Yeah, as much as I would love to say that there's one single thing, um, unfortunately, there's not. And and if you do have a vendor that's saying, hey, just buy this and you'll be protected, um, I would run as, as fast as you possibly <laughs> could because the, the reality is there isn't one solution. There, 
there are solutions. You could put a firewall in place and that will protect your, your network from external attacks. But what if somebody plugs a USB stick into a PC? Um, and, and similarly, if you went with endpoint protection and somebody d attacked you through your router, uh, it, there's unfortunately not one single thing. So it is all about layering up those defenses, um, working with the likes of yourselves at NetThreat to understand risks um, that that environment faces um, and making sure that those are addressed um, and, and covered off. Okay, and um, another question, if I may, Ollie, how do you see um, AI affecting uh, cybersecurity? Okay, so AI is an interesting one. Now, obviously, there's a lot of people out there that would just be like, ah, it's just a buzzword. It's, it's not really going to impact us. But unfortunately, and fortunately, it is. And it is going to become more and more prominent, uh, especially in the cybersecurity market, or cybersecurity world, not market, um, both for, for good and bad. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the bad. Um, I've seen like the significant rises in malware a lot of this is driven through ai the tools are automatically going off and seeing if if vendors technologies will detect them and if they do it will then automatically try and manipulate and, and morph um that that strain of malware to avoid uh, techniques um <coughs> detection techniques so that's that's one thing um i've also seen some uh pretty worrying sort of uh sort of ai uh, generated content that, that if you think about we often hear with like our grandparents that they they fall victim to sms victims of or smishing as we call it and phone um sort of calling up and like pretending to be somebody that they're not well i've now even seen where they can get into a compromised user's whatsapp see who they might have chats with but also if they've got access to like the phone for example or they just go social media and that person publishes content they take images and they can now create videos and maybe even like call the mum for example of that contact and simulate a phone call or a video call pretending to be that mum's child and go mm -hmm. hey mum I'm stuck in wherever I need a payment and they're doing it all using AI and it's really mm -hmm really scary um because it kind of like when's it gonna stop um mm -hmm. and obviously the elderly and sort of uh, they're more likely to fall victim to this but not necessarily think i'm going to ask the questions to prove that that is my daughter i'm going to panic mm -hmm. and see oh my god that's my daughter on the phone and she needs money i better transfer it as quickly as possible yeah. um the counter argument to that is AI is is really helping us improve security. I've mentioned it through my presentation um, a few times that we at WatchGuard are using AI. Um, our latest technology, network detection and response, actually uses AI to baseline an environment. So it will go in, uh, we install it in the in the network, and it will monitor the environment for a period of time to understand what's normal for that environment because every environment is different people do things differently, they run different processes, they have different servers, etc. So it can understand what a good sort of normal is. And then as soon as anything starts acting differently and out of the norm, it can create alerts, it can sort of isolate based on that. So we can use AI to actually um, be really clever for us. And we, we do the same uh, with sort of malware detection. We're using AI not to say, hey, this is definitely malware because I've seen it before. We're using AI to say, actually, based on models that I've been trained, the probability is that this is 80% chance of malware and therefore we can combat it. So, yeah, AI is going to be used more for cybersecurity defenses, but unfortunately, it's also going to be used by the bad guys as well. A long answer to that question. <laughs> no, it's, it's a very interesting topic uh, and one which is uh, sort of very relevant to us all. Um, thank you, um, Ollie. Does anybody else have any uh, further comments or questions for um, Pete or Ollie this morning? No? Okay. Well, obviously, anything you think of, you know how to get hold of us. Um, I'd just like to bring the session to a, a close by um, thanking uh, Ollie and uh, obviously thanking my colleague P. And I hope you found it really interesting. Obviously, anything we can help with, give us a call 0121 270 1800. And we're always happy to help and advise. Uh, thank you for listening and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye bye now. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.